Nimrod, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, and we saw that's a bad connotation. This was not a compliment. It could be translated that he was a tyrant. There were several ways that we could look at the hunter word in scripture. It's always got an evil connotation. If you didn't get verses before to back that up, First Shmuel, First Samuel, chapter 24, verses 9 through 11. If you have a King James Version, it makes it clear in verse 11, it says, Yet you, thou huntest my soul to take it. Uh, you might have some different words in other translations, but that was the idea behind it. Hunting someone down to take, not in a good way. We saw other verses, um, Ezekiel, um, Hezekiel chapter 13 and 18. Also, the King James uses the word hunt literally. Uh, New American uses the word capture, but again, it's a negative. It's a bad connotation. In between, we had verses like Job 10:16. Uh, Psalm 140, 11, that's chapter 140, verse 11, Proverbs 6 and 26, and Micah um, chapter 7 and verse 2. Just to give you, if you came into this class and didn't have that class, but we saw that, that when they were a hunter of men's souls, it was the antithesis. It was against the Lord. It was not used in a good way. When the Lord seeks, is a different word when he's seeking the soul to save. It's a different way that it's expressed. And especially the word translated before in our English here, really from the Hebrew would be against the Lord or in the face of the Lord, in defiance of the Lord. So he was a mighty hunter against the Lord or, or flying in the face of the Lord, coming against him in defiance. We saw that the uh, Jerusalem Targum, which is a well-respected, uh, their oral commentaries that were passed down, but from revered um, rabbis who studied the scriptures, that the, the Jerusalem one in particular said he was powerful in hunting and in wickedness before the Lord. For he was a hunter of the sons of man, and he said to them, Depart from the judgment of the Lord and adhere to the judgment of Nimrod. Therefore it said, As Nimrod the strong one, strong in hunting and in wickedness before the Lord. It sounds to me a lot like Satan had a hold of his heart, just as Satan wanted to be the one calling the shots, the one in control, and the one that they looked to, the one that they worshipped. I think Nimrod was trying to be like a god. He wanted to be a tyrant. He wanted to rule the world. And we'll see that as we go on into verse 10. Uh, the end of 9, uh, uh, actually in the middle of 9, it said, It is said. It was a fact. He was trying to make a name for himself. And that's what we see when we get into verse 10 now. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Eric and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. And I'm not telling you I know how to pronounce every word accurately. I'm just simply reading through them as best I can also. But the beginning of his kingdom is a key phrase there. He built himself a kingdom to rule over. He wanted a kingdom so he could be king. And it is thought that he probably um, organized cities and if there were wild beasts, that was one of the views that we saw last week, that it, he could have protected people from wild animals and made a name for himself in that way. Also, definitely, I believe that he was hunting souls in the way that we've already talked about. But it could be that he organized these cities um, to keep the people safe from the wild animals that were out there. It could have been just that he had uh, that leadership quality that he pulled them together ruling over them quickly to set himself up like a king and that his ambition probably most likely was to be uh, to build a world empire and be head over it. Why can I say that? Well hang on with me if we get through 10 and get into chapter 11, the first nine verses of chapter 11, we're going to see that, that the world uh, at that time was united to build this world empire and it's very interesting because here it says the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And that name is going to be key in chapter 11. So I think the thought is continuation in chapter 11. I don't think it's a, a sudden turn. Babel originally, uh, really from the, the more archaic language, really was Babalu. And like I said last week, those of you who are I Love Lucy fans, no, I'm not saying Babalu that Ricky's doing the drums to. But it was spelled in, you know, roughly B-A-B-I-L-U. And Nimrod founded a city, named it Babalu. He didn't name it Babel. Babalu meant gate of God. So how do we get Babel here? 
Well, Babel's what the Hebrews called it. And when Moshe, who we believe, Moses, who we believe compiled and brought the first five books together and has given, in essence, the title of author over them, we know that he compiled from others. He also wrote what God told him to write, and we know that God is ultimate author. But he, being a Hebrew, would put in the word Babel rather than an archaic word that was related but not Hebrew. And Babel, we, we find in the Hebrew, means confusion. We use the expression, you're babbling, you're not, you know, it's not making sense, it's not cohesive, it comes off of this. And we'll see a little bit more as we go on why the Hebrew word would be what Moshe would have given it because it was, well, I'll just say it now, it was more fitting, okay? But we'll explain that as we go along. Now, Nimrod, calling it the gate of God, he's not meaning Elohim, the Most High God, the God of Israel, the God that we worship and respect also. Remember, if he's setting himself up, he's wanting to be that God. So he's calling himself now to not only be a protector of the people, but he's a religious leader and he's putting himself up in essence to be worshipped. So this gateway to God is... Uh, Again, it's not the God that we refer to when we talk about God and worshiping God. Um, and it became a symbol of the power of the world in its hostility toward God. If you don't know what I mean, hang on for chapter 11. You'll see it very clearly. But there was, at this time, there was a complex of cities that were centered around Babylon. What's, even, what's called Babylon even today. We're talking about that area. And Babel became the capital of these cities. Archaeology gives us um, the information about this. And last week at the end of class, I gave you all homework and I said, see if you can find out because I want you to realize we're not talking just a little square block here. We're not talking about people that live like cavemen in, in, in uh, caves. Where else do cavemen live? <laughs> But we're talking about people that really had a lot of intelligence, a lot of wit, a lot of ability, a lot of creativity. We're going to see that this flies in the face of evolution, but we're going to see the factuality of what, this was a bustling city. Did anyone do the homework? Did anyone find, I told them to compare it to a major city in our world today. And then I even tipped my hand and I said, compare it to London. And somebody's got a daughter going to London, she might be looking into what London is like. Well, how does Babel compare to London in size? Anyone get the answer? Okay, good. That means you still need a teacher. <laughs> okay, it was considered from archaeology that it was at least five times the size of London and possibly as much as ten times the size of London. That's huge. I did have the privilege once of being in London for a very short time. I don't remember a lot, but one of the things I remember is the, the family that took me around a little bit took me to their zoo. Now, I was used to Los Angeles Zoo. You go to the zoo, you park your car in the parking lot, you get out of your car, and you go in and you see the animals. Their zoo was so large, you drove through the zoo, and it was like safari. It was huge. That was just the zoo. So London's huge. London's got, you know, um, far more than their zoo. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But my idea is this was a huge bustling community. It had a lot going for it. And this is what Nimrod was building up and setting himself as head over like a god. So we've got uh, the very beginning of, of a great city is what one of my other, um, I think that's what... Uh, I think it's what the complete Jewish Bible called it, but don't quote me on that. Anyway, it, it was large. It had a lot going on. We see also that there was Eric, and that's also called Uruk, U-R-U-K, if you get into the ancient languages. That was 100 miles southeast of Babylon. So Nimrod's head over Babylon, which is huge, and then you go 100 miles southeast of Babylon, and you come to Eric or Uruk, and He's over that, and the excavations there of that area show a very ancient writing. They say that this writing that they have found, uh, it would be in cuneiform and, and so forth, but that it even predated Avraham, 
Well, we're right here just ahead of Avraham's time. In, in a couple of classes, you're going to be introduced to a great man. Can't wait to make him alive for you. But here we're being told that before Avraham, we've got all this developed writing, records that were being kept, things that archaeology has found. So again, you had intelligence. You didn't have caveman mentality. You didn't have the man dragging the woman by the hair with the club. <laughs> okay, you've got people who could put together a city. And you know what all it takes for a city if you've ever built a city in a game. We, when I had the, the little ones, we had a computer game where they got to build a city. And it taught a lot of what you need. You need you know, streets and you need homes and you need buildings and you need police and you need government and you need you know, all kinds. And Babylon had it. Okay, Akkad, the other name that was in here in verse 10, was immediately north of Babylon. So Babylon's like the hub. We're going up north, we're going southeast, we're spreading wide out. Kalna, they still haven't identified it archaeologically, but the early writers think it's, and I have to spell it, I have no idea how to say it, C-T-E-S-I-P-H-O-N, Cetesiphon, I have no idea. Anyway, it was northeast of Babel, it was on the eastern bank of the Tigris, it was 22 miles south of present-day Baghdad, so that area in Iraq that we know of today, if all of this was taking place in that area, and I just, again, I'm saying it again and again, but get the idea, this was, this was big, this was a lot, this wasn't just a few little people and, and they didn't know how to even communicate. Shinar, it said it was in the land of Shinar, or Shinar, depending on your pronunciation. We know later that's where Babylon was located when we read in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, talk about um, Babylon in the land of Shinar. And again, it's modern day Iraq. Um, at this time, it was north of the Persian Gulf on the Euphrates. So you've got the Tigris, Euphrates, you've got the cities, you've got the communities. And all of this is probably within 200 to 300 years after the flood. Remember, we looked last week and we found out that Noah's big mistake, I'll call it, wasn't a week out of the ark. The time had passed before it happened. So again, we've moved down about 200, 300 years since the flood to this thriving community or metropolis, maybe I should put it that way. And what happened? From that land, verse 11, he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh and Rehoboth, Ur and Kala. Okay, so he went out from the land uh, the Hebrew literally says, out of that land, he went forth into Assyria. You might have a Shur, A-S-S-H-U-R, ancient name Assyria is what we also know this area by. And we're told about Nineveh. Anyone remember that name from another book? The whale. <laughs> the whale. <laughs> the whale of the story. <laughs> okay. Yes, and it is the same Nineveh. Okay. I just want you to know that's situated on the upper Tigris River. As Babylon was on the Euphrates, Nineveh was on the Tigris. It was roughly 200 miles north of Babylon, and later the capital of the great Assyrian Empire is right there. That's Nineveh. Okay. So Babylon and Assyria were subsequently conquered by the Semites. Now, who were the Semites? The Semites were the ones who descended from Shem. And what did we learn about Shem's line last week? Shem would rule over Ham's line. Remember, Ham, Ham, the, the descendants, they would be in the position of servitude to Shem's line. And Japheth, Japheth also, his family would, would be in the ruling class like Shem that Shem got the, the highest we see as we go on, and we'll see why in just a little bit. But very interesting that early on, when we have Babylon and Assyria conquered, it's by those that God said would be the ones that would rule over the others. Kala, C-A-L-A-H, was excavated on the Tigris, about 20 miles south of Nineveh, and it's still called to this day, when you get into the ancient, you know, and you study it from there, they call it Nimraad, N-I-M-R-A-A-D. It's spelled just slightly different, but it was named that after its founder, Nimrod. So still holding to that ancient name even. 
Verse 12, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Okay, you might have Rehoboth, or you may have Rezin, or you may have both like we do in 11 and 12. They don't know exactly where those areas were. They would have been in this area that I'm describing, but again, they haven't been able to identify specifically what those areas were, but calling it a great city meant also a large metropolis, a large area, metropolis, I'm sorry, a large area. Um, when we look at Hezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 27, we have recorded all kinds of traits, all kinds of occupations, all kinds of races. That was about 1,600 years after the flood. So very quickly we have development. We'll keep talking about that. I don't mean to harp on it, but it's very important because it flies in the face of evolution. That talks about it taking billions of years, millions of years, thousands of years, whatever it's saying. We're going to see God says, uh-uh, and he does it in a much smaller amount of time and in a greater way. Verses 13 and 14 have many names and they're not yet identified by archaeology. Mitzrayim became the father of Ludim and Anamim and Lahabim and Nafutalim <laughs> and Parthrusim and Kesluhim. I even practice these. They're still tongue twisters. <laughs> From which came the Philistines. That's a name you'll be familiar with. And Kaftorim. So we begin to identify a little bit, but we don't know much about them yet. But that's going to bring us into Canaan again, or Canaan. Remember, he was Ham's son. We saw that he probably was alive at the time of Noah's sin and, and maybe even entered in to helping to spread the word about it or in some way his, his heart, we get the idea, was already rebellious toward God. That it isn't because of what happened, but it showed, it revealed what was already going on. Well, he became the father of Sidon, Sidon. That was, Sidon was the progenitor of the Phoenicians. And once the capital of Phoenicia, and we're talking Lebanon area now, 120 to 200 miles strip along the Mediterranean Sea. So if you go up north of Israel into Lebanon, you look along the Mediterranean Sea, this is the area that we're talking about. Jezebel came from here. And what did she do for Israel? And I'm not going to say bless her heart, <laughs> because I would not mean that. She brought the worship of Baal, the false god Baal, and all of the idolatry that went along with that and all the trouble it caused Israel came from Jezebel when she was brought into Israel to be King Ahab's or Ahab's wife. Sad note in our Israel history. Okay. But where was she from? Lebanon, from that area. Oh. From, actually from Saddam, that we call Lebanon today. Yeah, so she wasn't real far. But um, she was out of land. She wasn't who a king of Israel should have been looking for for a wife. Definitely not God's choice. Um, remember Canaan here, Canaan? He had 11 sons that are listed in Scripture. He had unknown number of daughters. So we're not going to be surprised when we see a lot of Canaanites or Canaanites. There would be a lot that could come because, you know, if each was prolific like their dad, my goodness, you've got a whole army, a whole tribe, you know, in no time. And they were the tribes that the Israelites fought with many a time in our original uh, Testament scriptures. From the record, they would know they were of the cursed line then. Canaan and all that these, his descendants would know they were in that line that God said, because of what your, your grandfather did, your tribe is going to be the servants, they're going to be subdued. They're not going to have that, that lead position. Uh, at one time, Sidon, Sidon, however I should say it, was the capital of ancient Phoenicia. And the family of Sidon, the tribe, whatever I should call it, they went on further up north, and they are related to who, we've re, who we call the Hittites, or Heth sometimes in scripture, and the other Lebanese people that you find further up north. The Sinite, Sinite, S-I-N-I-T-E, many people um, believe, or many of the, you know, these who have studied the history of how people moved and where they came from, they say that those are the people that, the, the I'm sorry, the Oriental people are the ones who descended <laughs> from the Sinites. 
Now, I'm not talking Japanese and Chinese and how we use Oriental today, but Oriental in Bible times was called the people of the East. And we'll hear about the Oriental traditions that were even prevalent in the land of Israel during Yeshua's time. That's the Orient that, that I'm talking about here. Heth that we just referred to, or the Hittites, we'll see them in chapter 23 when we get there. It'll be a little while, but we'll pick them back up. Um, and when they were in chapter 23, we're going to see, in verse 10 in particular, if you want to look up ahead, we're going to see when they're down in Israel, they're living in the area called Hebron or Hebron today, that that's where they moved. So even though they were north, they also came down south into the land of Israel. Heth ruled a great empire. It was mainly the area of eastern Turkey today, Asia Minor. Heth was a ruler over it, or his, the Hittites, for about 800 years. At that time, um, no, sorry, let me put it this way. At the time of Avraham, you find that the Hittites were already in what's called Canaan, the land of Israel, and this area. Let me take you real fast, because it'll be just a little bit before we get there. It's Genesis 15, and we're going to look at verses 18 to 21. Genesis 15, 18 to 21, because what we're having is heads of families that we become known, you know, they become known to us. We're beginning to see, you know, they all started out from the three brothers and they went out filling the, the earth, but actually they didn't go out yet to fill the earth. We're going to find out they didn't do what they were supposed to do. Chapter 15, verse 18 says, On that day the Lord made a covenant with Avram, saying, To your descendants I've given this land, from the river of Egypt, that would be the Nile, as far as the great river, the river, the river Euphrates. So from Egypt to Iraq, all that area, God's saying he's giving it to Avram, and we'll know that that's to Israel as we see it develop in time. And notice who was there, the Kenite, the Kenizzite, the Kadmonite, the Hittite, there's our name, the Perizzite, and the Raphaim, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, Canaanite, again, Ham's line, the Girgashite, and the Jebusite. And of course, the others of these are related to Ham's line also. But notice how many were already there in Avram's day. And we're not quite to Avram yet, but we're seeing that there was a lot of movement. We're going to see what sent them out very shortly. That's chapter 11 that, that we'll see. But 10 is written after 11 has happened. So we were getting information because they knew more than, than um, what was happening at the moment in chapter 10. Okay? I hope that was clear. Um, these people, the Hittites, the Heth, they were still a power to be reckoned with in the time of Shlomo, in the time of Solomon, about a thousand years later. We'll read of them in Second Chronicles chapter 1 and verse 17, if you want to look that up on your own. And it's interesting to note also that until the 20th century, that's not that far back from us, until the 20th century, the Hittites were unknown apart from the Bible. So again, another time when the, the non-Bible believers were saying, you know, this isn't right, this isn't true. Well, guess what? Archaeology has now dug up enough that they're finding that these Heth or Hethite people were the ones that were known as the Hatti, H-A-T-T-I people, or the K-H-E-T-A, Keta people. I don't know, but my point being, they gave them other names and they didn't realize, but archaeology has finally put it together and proven once again that the Bible is accurate. I love it the way the Bible gets proven all the time. Anybody who wants to come up against the Word of God, be prepared for a fall because the Word of God will always, always prevail, always be proven true. Um, this, in my footnote in my Bible, I have that the Hittite Empire had its times of prominence around 2000 to 1800 BC. That would be the time of Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Esau, all of those. And it also was from 1400 to 1200 BC proven to be an empire to deal with. And that's right there in the time of Shlomo, Solomon, David's time, David Solomon being David's son. So from that time on. So once again, what we read in the Bible, what we were told they were, were you know, the enemies of Israel at those times is proven true by archaeology today. Love it. 
let's go back to Genesis 10. And I think we're ready for verse 16. I think I have done all I can to the names in 15, 16. We have the Jebusite, the Amorite, and the Girgashite. The Jebusite was a tribe in the neighborhood of Yerushalayim. They were also called the, um, and the J would be silent in Hebrew, so Abus, again, forgive me. We'll call them Jebus because it's easier to say it, J-E-B-U-S. That might sound very familiar to some of you who know a little bit of our Jewish history. Let's look real quick at Judges 19.10. Judges chapter 19 and verse 10. And here we read in Judges 19 and verse 10. But the man was not willing to spend the night, so he arose and departed and came to a place opposite Jabus, however I'm going to say it, that is Jerusalem. And there with him a pair of saddle donkeys, his concubine was with him also. Very sad, very hard to read chapter, but we have here that Jabus was like an earlier name somewhat known for the area called Jerusalem. Look with me at Joshua, going back toward um, Genesis. Joshua, the book just preceding Judges, we're going to go to Joshua chapter 15 and read verse 63. Yahshua, remember, is the one who brought the children of Israel into the promised land. So this is early on in Israel history in the land. Verse 63 says, now is for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The sons of Judah could not drive them out. So the Jebusites live with the sons of Judah at Jerusalem until this day. So Joshua had been commanded by God to lead the children of Israel in. They were to, to um, thrust out the people, the nations in the land that they would find because God said their evil was so bad he was going to thrust them out of that land, give that land to the children of Israel and put his name there. And we know he put his name in Jerusalem, on Jerusalem, where the temple was finally built, I'll put it that way. But we know that, that that was the place that God chose to put his name on. So when we read here that they didn't get rid of all the people, they weren't being fully obedient to God because he didn't give them that option. And you'll read much of this in the Kings and, and other um, books of the Bible, Joshua, other places too. My point being, by the time we get down to David wanting to have an area that he wanted to give to the Lord, wanted to build the altar for the Lord there, he bought Jerusalem from a Jebusite. It's, they were still there then. It's just like what our scriptures are telling us, and he, that he had to deal with, with them then. Um, the Jebusite had said was, oh, if you want it for God, I'll just give it to you, whether that was a ploy for let's negotiate or whether or not you can read between the lines as you want. But David's answer right away was, I will not give anything to the Lord that has not cost me something. He wanted it to be something that, that you know, he felt it, giving it to the Lord. Bless his heart. Man after God's own heart. The Amorites, back in verse 16 of chapter 10, sometimes that name is used to represent all of the Canaanites, Canaanites. Genesis chapter 15, I think we were there. I should have told you to hold on to it. But chapter 15 and verse 16, I'll just read it for you quickly, tells us, Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. So the Amorites were there four generations. Now, it's debatable how long a generation is in Scripture, but I can tell you close to this, I can't say really close to this time, but in Genesis, and I'll have to look for where, I didn't think to remember, but if, I mean, I didn't think to look it up ahead. I'm just going to, what I'm trying to say, and I'm babbling now, <laughs> so forgive me, um, that the generation could have been like 100 years because there is a place early on in our scriptures where it refers to generation being 100 years. It's not always 100 years. That's why I'm not saying you can't take that and run all the way through the Bible and say that's what a generation is. But back in this time, I would say that we're being told the Amorites were in the land Representing, representing the Canaanites probably about 400 years, you know, quite a while. So um, it's just interesting facts of these people because when they're so ancient and just names on a page, I don't 
know if you're like me, but you don't realize how much time is passing. Yes, Rowena. Can you help her unmute? We're trying. There we go. Yeah. You were looking for the verse. It's the verse before that one when they said they will be oppressed for 400 years and then in 16 they said the fourth generation will return here. So that counts for like a generation is like 100 years. Very good. And where was that? 13, verse 13. Of chapter? 15, 15 verse 13. Of chapter 15. That's why I'm not finding I'm back in 10. Okay, thank you. So it was right there where I was reading and I just I forgot. Thank you so much. In fact, I'm running back there. Genesis 15, 13, because it helps me to see it. Uh, yes, yeah, very good. Very good. Thank you, Rowena, for being on top of it. God said to Avram, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. And then when we got down to verse 16, then in the fourth generation, they'll return here. So that is how we put it together at this time with Avram anyway. Generation was about... Um, a hundred years. Okay, Roger, did you have a question? No, I'll just say in Matthew, it's, it's changed from up to 35 years to actually 40 generations. Matthew is definitely, you'll see a generation be 40 years, you'll see a generation be 70 years. Some will argue that and say that's 80 years, and then you see the 100 years. So you have to know the time when, when God's talking. And we can begin to understand that because if you look at families today, we'll talk about the generations in a family. Now, my family was slow, so we have a lot of years in just three generations, where some people, some families in those same amount of years will have five generations because they all did it early. You know, they, Mom was 16, had a baby, daughter had a baby at 16, you know, it quickly, you know, so it's the same way. You have to understand the context to understand the years. Um, it is one reason we can't put a specific date on the return of the Lord, but we know it's within the generation that saw. So, if we did, it change it anyways. <laughs> Roger says, if we guessed it right, God would change it anyway, just because he said we wouldn't know. <laughs> okay, back on track. I think, I think I'm ready for verse 17. Am I back in it? I am. Okay, verse 17. And the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite. Okay, the Hivite, those were cities that were discovered all the way from Sidon in Lebanon all the way down to Jerusalem. So the Hivites were north of what we call Israel and down into Israel, the, what we call Israel today. Archites, they centered in Syria. Syria is above Lebanon, so a little farther up north. And the Sinite or Sinite, S-I-N-I-T-E, and I spell sometimes because it can sound so much like Semite, which was the Jewish races. I'm trying to make sure you can hear the difference. Sinite, these people could have been one of two locations. They could have been the Sinai Desert because of the names Mount Sinai, the Wilderness of Sin, the Sinai Desert, and even a famous city called Sinim. It's not famous to me, but in archaeological findings. S-I-N-I-M. So it could be. Sinite could come from that area, which would be more south. But there were also names in Lebanon where we are drawing these other people, which make me think it was more Lebanon. There you have Sina, S-I-N-N-A, a mountain, a fortress. You have Sini, S-I-N-I, and Sinum, S-I-N-U-M, probably towns, maybe even very close together towns. So those names also in the Lebanese area fit for the word Sinite, Sinite. So I can't tell you dogmatically which was which, but I can tell you there was a god by the name of Sin, and I'm saying little g, a god by the name of Sin that was found in Ur of the Chaldees. Now you're getting further up north and going east. So I just... Personal, I tend to think that we're talking northern, okay? And they may also have been the ancestors of those called the Orientals in that area at that time. Verse 18, Arvidite and the Zemrite and the Hamathite. I'll stop there for a moment. Arvad was a port city of the Phoenicians. Remember, the Phoenicians were on the Mediterranean Sea up north of Israel and down into Israel area, you know, what we call it today. Zemurite was six miles south of Arvad, 
a town known as Sumas. Today it's called Sumra, again, northern um, Syria and Lebanon area. Hamathite, associated with Hamath in Syria and frequently mentioned in later biblical history. So I think we've got our northern people pretty well um, in our minds where, where they came from. They spread about, uh, as according to the verse we're in, verse 18, um, Oh, okay, and afterward the families of the Canaanite, Canaanite were spread abroad. Um, I'm not sure what I just said a minute ago, but that's only said of the Canaanites. It suggests that they spread out further than others, that they, I'm going to say, wandered more. They spread north and they spread east into Asia and perhaps all the way to China. And if so, then you can see how the Oriental name began to reach to China where we still use the name today. Verse 19, the territory of the Canaanite extended from Sidon, north, as you would go toward Gerar, as far as Gaza. Okay, Sidon was north of Tyre in modern Lebanon today. Gaza is in the south part of Israel today. So again, you've got from northern above Israel down south. And then we have it said, as you go toward uh, now you say Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Amorah in uh, the Hebrew, and uh, also Adma and Zeboim as far as Lasha. Well, all the way through Sodom and Zeboim, all those names as east and south to the Dead Sea and the four cities of the plain, as they were called. At this time, Sodom and Gomorrah are not destroyed. At this time, they're, they're developing. Um, we read about them in other locations. We know that. Look real quickly just so you see I can back it up. Genesis 14, and we're going to look at verse 2. Genesis 14 and verse 2. That they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah. So here's your Sodom and Gomorrah. And then I think that we mentioned Adma. That's another one in verse 2. Maybe not. Okay. Chapter 19 of Genesis. So you have the starts of these people, but they, they didn't just start and stop. They grew, they became a peoples, a nation, a tribe, whatever I should say. Chapter 19, verses 24 and 25, the Lord reigned on Sodom and Amorah, brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities and all the valley. Remember it talked about the four cities in the plain in the valley? and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. And it goes on. That's the destruction you're familiar with, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. But notice that's all the way in chapter 19. And Genesis is giving us a historical record in order. So when we're back here in chapter 10, we're being told about the people settling in these areas, but we don't have their destruction yet, not for a while. And Lasha that was mentioned back here in Genesis chapter 10 has yet to be identified. We don't know exactly where Lasha was archaeologically, but it is um, the potential is that it was east of the Dead Sea. That's what the Jerusalem Targum said. It's, we just don't know how they got that record. <clears throat> Verse 20. These are the sons of Ham, Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, by their nations. Okay, again, by virtue of verse 20, you have to realize once again, what we're being told here happened, that their movements happened after chapter 11, because in chapter 10, before the huge change that comes in chapter 11, you didn't have languages and people separate by their languages, their lands, and their nations. You've got everybody all together still. Noah's three sons, sure they're spreading out because they've got so many family being born, but they're still, they're together. They were told, go fill the face of the earth. Does that mean Babel hadn't? Right, that's what I'm saying. Babel hadn't happened yet. We know that specifically because the languages hadn't happened yet. You'll see that as soon as I hit verse one of chapter 11. So again, we've got a historical comment in chapter 10 that's telling us these people were divided by their languages, by their families, by their, their nations. Chapter 11 tells us how they got to be 
families, tribes, and nations divided by language. But prior to that, it had not happened. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, very good. Then we'll go on. We'll find out about Shem's line, okay? And Shem's line is of great interest. Yes, go ahead, Dora. Okay, but I always thought that um, God, then God is the one that gave them the languages. It's not that they already have the languages. God gave them the languages at that time. Right, right. You're reading ahead or questioning ahead, okay. but you're right because I don't want you to be confused. I don't want you to be in Babel. <laughs> so, yes, God's the one that's going to give them languages and is going to send them out, and we're going to read about that in Chapter 11. And it'll be very clear. That's why those of you who got my, um, uh, you know, I send out the text message reminder you class, and I asked the question, you know, I give you a few things of what we're going to discuss in class, and I said, what was the original language? If you're, if you're thinking caps on, you got an answer right now. If you're not sure, hang tight. We'll give you an answer. But uh, that's why I could say that, because at this point, there is an original language. There's one language. I'll prove it from a verse in Scripture very shortly. But we're going to look at Shem's line first. And Shem, uh, if you don't know why I say it's a very important line, just keep your ears open. I think you'll find out why. Shem had five sons. He was a busy father. He was the father of all the children of Eber. Um, and the older brother of Japheth, children were born. Okay, I think I should have started reading from the first word also to Shem, the father of all the children of Ever, and the older brother, Ayafet, children were born. Okay, now I've read it where it can make sense to you. What we have is Shem has five sons, and he's, we're also going to see that we have five generations listed from Shem in before we're done with this chapter here. The father of all the children of Ever, Eber, you might say, it's Hebrew. The word Hebrew is derived from this word, ever, Eber. And Abraham is the first one to be called a Hebrew. The first time he's called that is in chapter 14. Let's run over there real quick. Chapter 14 of Genesis, and we're going to verse 13. We're going to see Avram gets that title of um, Eber, or ever. It's closer to the Hebrew. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 14, verse 13 says, Then a fugitive came and told Avram the Hebrew. Now he was living by the Oaks of Mamre, and it goes on. Why was Avram called, uh, called the Hebrew, the ever, <laughs> and Hebrew coming out of that root word? It means crossed over. That's what the Hebrew means. There's a dual meaning to it. One is he literally crossed over the river, and went to the land God told him to go to. We'll read that very soon when we start studying Avram, but it also was symbolic of the fact that he crossed over from idolatry, which his whole family was involved in, to worship the one true and living God. And that's how we use the word Hebrew to this day. It's crossed over from any idolatry into the worship of the one true and living God, the God of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which makes him the God of Israel. Because out of Yaakov, Jacob, come the 12 tribes that build what we call Israel to this day. You just got to... Long history put in a sentence, <laughs> okay? So he's the father of the children of Eber. Um, Abraham's the first one called by that. But going back, we're going to see in chapter 10, and I've got to run back and get there myself. In chapter 10 of Genesis, in verse 21, where we are, jump down real quick and look at verse 25. And we read that two sons were born to Eber. This is the Eber that we're mentioning up here in verse 21. Okay, so two sons are going to be born to him. They're going to be Peleg and Joktan, just to give you the names right now. Um, so when the name Eber was given here, it probably referred to both sons. And it wasn't meaning, it didn't have the full meaning that it has come to, to mean by the time it gets applied to Abraham and goes on further. Okay, so Shem's going to have five sons, and we're going to see Eber has two sons. We're going to see the line continuing on down. 
You'll see why I'm singling out those people in just a bit. But notice the phrase, um, now I have the older brother of Japheth. You may have Japheth the elder, okay? I'm not quite sure what your translation will read, but what it seems to indicate, no matter what translation you're in, that out of Noah's three sons, and we talked about this before, they weren't triplets. They were born different times, so you're going to have an older, you're going to have a youngest, and you're going to have one in the middle. Now, Ham's not mentioned at all. Shem and Japheth are the only two named. Japheth probably was mentioned because of his close association with Shem. Remember, Shem gets told you're going to be the blessed line, and then Japheth, you're going to be in the blessings of the tent of Shem. That was saying you're going to, to also partake of his blessings. The, um, that was a prophecy that was given by their father, Noah. This is chapter 9 and verse 27. Now, it may have also been that Japheth, Japheth was the oldest son. And if so, then out of respect for the elder, because the elder held great importance, especially as we go down in the Jewish families, the elder would receive the double birthright, or the birthright, the double blessing. The older had the responsibilities of being the leader, the spiritual leader for the family, taking care of the widow. If the widow outlives the, the father, the, ma the patriarch of the family, etc., etc. We see a lot of importance put on the oldest son in scripture. So it could be he was named here in that way to, to just a bow of respect to him, tip the hat to him. It could be that, or it could be again, because he was uh, closely related to Shem in receiving blessing that uh, both of these brothers had that blessing given where Ham, who was told his line would be cursed, doesn't even get a mention in here. Um, and it is quite likely from the Hebrew, when we look at the Hebrew meaning, that Japheth was the oldest and Ham was probably in the middle and Shem was probably the youngest by the time we can figure it out from putting several different verses together. Can't say that dogmatically, but quite likely and often often in scripture god will single out one who is not the oldest it's often the youngest who gets singled out you've got jacob and esau and it's jacob who was the youngest so it many times i'm sure your mind's clicking off um so just just point of interest okay uh, yes okay explain to me if the oldest son it's supposed to get all this stuff. Why is he looked over? Is it because God told him to? Because God gave a greater blessing. He pulled Shem up and put Shem into that first he place. See this heart and stuff that he would follow the Lord. Even more than that, I'll go ahead. What I've hinted at, I'll go ahead and spell out because it's a good question. Dora's asking. Why do we see Shem lifted up? Why is Shem being moved up into that higher position? And the reason I believe is because as we continue on genealogically, Messiah comes from Shem's line. That's why out of the three, this was the most important because we have to have the genealogical line to the Messiah. We, we have to know that to prove he is Messiah. So... Shem's the line that's going to carry that, and I believe that's why he was brought up into preeminence, into that, that top position. When you have Avram have um, Ishmael, excuse me, Ishmael really is his oldest son. Yitzhak was born later, but Yitzhak is brought up into that prominent position. He's but because the first one was born out of flesh, not what God said. Right. Right. Ishmael was of the flesh. It was Abraham and Sarah trying to help God out. Like Gavalt, we pay that price to this day. <laughs> and I'm not going against a whole people, trust me, but you know what I'm meaning. Um, but yes, yes. The godly line will see God lift up. The messianic line will see God lift up. We'll see him put a spotlight on what's important. It was more important for us to know Shem's line in more detail than it was even Japheth since Messiah is going to come from Shem. Okay? Okay. All right. So we are back in verse 22. 
The sons of Shem were Alam and Ashur and Arpachad, Shad, however, and Lud and Aram. How would you like to be calling those kids to dinner one night? <laughs> it was a mouthful for us. It probably was easy for them. Elam is the area he is known for, east of Babylon and the Persian Gulf. Later, the Persians will come from from there, the, the ancestor of the Edomites, we'll put it that way. Again, Genesis 14 gives us some of that. And Ashur, as I said earlier, is Assyria. It was Nineveh, remember, um, he built Nineveh, which Nimrod, Nimrod invaded. Um, chapter 10 and verse 11, if you don't remember that, from the land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh. So Nimrod, pushed his way into Nineveh, and he, in essence, invaded it, built it, made it his city, kind of like he made it his head, his capital. Okay, well, consequently, the Assyrian people and the culture were mixed with the Semitic and the, how do I say it? They were mixed with Ham's line and um, with Shem's line because they're, you know, they're all living in that area. So my point is when we talk about a Semitic people, S-E-M-I-T-I-C, when we talk about the Semitic people, the Semites, their languages, we're talking about Hebrews, we're talking about Arabs, we're talking about Syrians, and we're talking about Assyrians. They were all related. Okay, maybe I can call them cousins. <laughs> they were all related. So Semite can include both Jew and Arab, and it does when you get back in history like this. There was no Jew at this point. There was no Arab at this point, but you get my idea. It's the lines as we come now. That when it's a mouthful, our Pachshad, that's the son through whom the line moves toward the Messiah. So you had Shem, Ever, a Pachshad, that's the important line. Um, and we'll see Avraham comes from that line. That's chapter 11. It's, we'll just look at the beginning. Read 11, 10 to 27, and that'll prepare you for next week's class because I'm sure we're not going to cover all of that today. At least I don't think. Anyway, um, let me just start with 11 and verse 10. It says, These are the records of the generations of Shem. Shem was 100 years old, became the father of Arkpashad two years after the flood. Shem lived 500 years, and you keep going, oh, yeah, and he had our, our pox shot, I can't say that. You keep reading, you get down to, where did I just tell you, verse 27, yes. No, 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 I'm sorry, verse 25, right? Where did I tell us to go to? Okay, well, we're going to end up in 27, but let's look at 25. You have the names coming down. They're giving you father to son, to son, to son, to son. You're coming on down, you've got Nahor. Um, became the father of Terah. Nahor lived, well, it tells you how long he became the father of Terah. Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram. So you finally get down to Abram, Abraham, in this line that we started up there in verse 10 with Shem. So we've got Shem's line bringing us to Abraham. We know Abraham is the line that brings us to Messiah because it's easy to recognize Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And you know the line goes on down through there. Okay, so our pox shot is going to be the important one. And if I run you over to Luke, real quick, Luke chapter 3, where we get the genealogy of Yeshua, we will read some familiar names now with all this in mind. Luke chapter 3 and verse 36, and we will read there. The son of Kainan, the son of our pox shot, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech. Aren't those names familiar to you now, even if I am slaughtering them in pronunciation? Well, you've got the line that, that is being given. If I had started you earlier, um, it goes, oh goodness. It goes all the way back. Look at verse 23. When he began his ministry, Yeshua Jesus himself was about 30 years of age, being as it was supposed, the son of Yosef, the son of Eli. And it goes on down through. Now we know that Yeshua was born of a virgin. So we know that he did not carry the bloodline of his father. He had the bloodline of his mother, which gave him the regal right to the throne. That's Matthew's genealogy versus Luke's genealogy. But still the point being, this is the family line that he came through. Okay, moving back to Genesis. We're going to go 
all the way back to chapter 10 again. And I've got... To, oh. Yes, we're still in chapter 10 of Genesis. Yes. 11's the tower. So, <laughs> well, we're going through the families. We're in 10. And we're going to look at... We're still in verse 22. We have Lud, L-U-D, mentioned in verse 22. That's the Lydians in Asia Minor, according to Josephus. It's now what we call Western Turkey. So the people who populated that area came from Lud. Aram became the Arameans or the Arameans. They're known as the Syrians. The Aramaic language, you hear that used. That was adopted by most of the leading nations of the ancient world, uh, including Assyria, including Babylonia. Parts of the book of Daniel, Daniel, part of Ezra, were written in Aramaic. Hebrew is not far off from Aramaic, but... Uh, uh, and Aramaic was also the common language still being spoken in the time that Yeshua walked on this earth. So the, this stemmed from the, the, these people known as the Syrians, Aram, or Aram, and their language, the Aramaic language, as it develops. But it's still not there now. I'm not telling you they spoke Aramaic now. They're still speaking one language, and we'll talk about what language that is as soon as we get to chapter 11. Okay, verse 23, the sons of Aram were Uz, Uz, and Hol, and Gether, and Mosh. Okay, Uz, that was a place in northern Arabia, west of the Arabian desert. That was where Job lived. Job, you know, Job, our whole book of Job, that's where he lived. Chapter 1 and verse 1 tells you that he lived in Uz, or Uz. Um, apparently, Job was of the line of Shem. It's the idea that we get. It fits also because he was greatly blessed, and Shem's line was to be greatly blessed. Now, it's thought that Job lived at the time of what we call the patriarchs, at the time of, I'll just stop with Abram, because he's the start of the patriarchs going down. And the way we get that is because of his age. He lived, it said, 140 years after God blessed his end time. That's Job 42 and verse 16, almost the end of the book. He's gone through all the trial that Job goes through where he lost all his, um, I think he lost his crops first. He lost the cattle. He lost all of his sons and daughters. You know, he, he lost just about everything. But after all that testing, when he's come through and God is able to bless him and blesses his end better, greater than his beginning, he lived 140 years in that blessing, and that age that puts Job at the age he was is the same amount of years that they were living in Abraham's time. We're going to see that the lifespan shortened very quickly from Noah on down. Noah lived 950 years. Abram lives 175 years. That's a big difference. So when you look at how long Job lived, it's approximately in the time that Abraham would have been living. That, that was the age span during that time. So that's how we put that connection together. Um, Job's faith, his worship, shows that the truth of God had spread with the people because the people are going to go. Okay, we've got the starts here, and we, we're, I'm telling you ahead of time where they went. I just haven't told you what sent them out yet. Okay? So it's like we're stopped here in our story this is how far we've gotten, but we're looking down through the corridor of time and we see all these peoples all over in these areas that I've been mentioning. That's what we're doing. But uh, how would it have spread to Job? Job? Well, if he lived at the time of Abraham, do you remember how close Noah and Abraham were? Do you remember last week I told you that Noah died how many years before Abram was born? Okay. Likely two years, just short. Noah died two years later, Abram's born. So Noah's son Shem was alive when Abram was born, and they very likely could have known and talked to each other because they haven't spread out yet. Okay? So Shem, a godly line, being obedient to God, respecting his father, being the line to the Messiah, he would have been passing down godly lineage to his progeny. And Job could have been one of them. Okay? Verse 24. Arpachshad became the father of Shelah. 
Shelah became the father of Eber. We've got another Eber here, okay? Don't get confused. Just like today, we can have names that are used in different times, okay? Again, different families and all of that. Hebrew, I'm sorry, not Hebrews. How did I get that? Um, chapter 11 and verse 12 is going to say that Arpachad had Sheila at 35 years of age. So we've got the family line here, and 11 is, chapter 11 is going to tell us more. But let me, let me stay in 10 so we can get to 11. Notice 25 tells us something very interesting that happened to this earth. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. Okay, Peleg means divided or division. Now, this word in our Hebrew, when it's talking about divided, this dividing was by bringing pressure or force to bear on an object so as to divide it. There's a different Hebrew word, completely different Hebrew word from pellet, and it's parad, and that's the one that means to divide, like to give a portion to. Like if I took a pie and I divided that pie into pieces and I gave you a piece of that pie, I'd be using a word called parad. I'd be using that kind of division. But when I use the word pellet, this type of division in our Hebrew is something and there's a split. So there's some sort of pressure that comes and divides, okay? Let me give you a couple other examples of the word pelag in scripture. Go with me to Job. We're going to use him again, Yov. Um, and we're going to go to chapter 38, Job 38. Not quite to the end, but a very famous chapter. I love it. It's when God answers Job and he just shows them how mighty he is, how amazing, how ineffable, how indescribable. How, wow. Just read that whole chapter. I love it. It thrills my soul. And if you ever wonder if God can help you, <laughs> read chapter 38. So in verse 25, it says, who has cleft a channel for the flood? That word cleft is pellet. Who's made a channel for the floodwaters to go through? When the floodwaters landed on the rocks and they made a way through, that's a lot of pressure to divide rocks and to open it up and to let the waters go on through. But it, it's to cut a channel. It's, um, it's pellet, but cut, cleft, whatever word you want to use in English, a channel for the floods. Let me show you in Psalm, Tehillim, Psalm 46. Again, a favorite one of mine, but what word of God isn't favorite? Uh, Psalm 46 and verse 4. Uh, just getting down there. If you, again, if you're in trouble, read verse 1, that God is there to help you. Why does that encourage you? Because of how powerful God is. No matter how big you think your problem is, you've got a bigger God than your problem. Verse 4 tells us there's a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Okay, there's a river, the channels of which make the city of God glad. So this city has rivers that are dividing it that God has caused that to happen. He's divided, he's brought cleavage, there's been power there. Uh, in the Hebrew dictionary, if you look up the word pelag, it'll call it a small channel of water or a river or a stream like a cleavage. So again, you've got something major that's happened, a force that's come down and caused a splitting. It's not the other word of, I'm just going to give you a portion. What happened? Well, if we look at our continents, we know that there is a time when our continents were all together. They all fit together like a puzzle. If you haven't ever seen that or been taught that in science, trust me and look at a globe later and you will see. There, you have to do some shifting now because these continents have shifted and have moved, but there was a time when all the dry land was separated from the oceans, remember? Then, of course, we have the change with the flood. Well, what we have here apparently, or the idea we're given, is this must be the time when the Earth's continents were split from each other. God probably is the originator of that. There might have been a huge earthquake. I don't know. There was something that brought pressure. 
it has to be something other than the flood because we weren't told it happened in Noah's day. We're told it happened in Peleg's day, that Peleg got named for it. Something so severe that they named their child. Maybe they had their child the day after it happened. There was this great dividing, so they called their son Divide, you know, to remember when it happened. I don't know if it's always true, but a lot of times a child named Stormy was born on a stormy night. <laughs> you know, not always. There can be other reasons, but it is interesting. There is um, scientifically proof that the continents were together and that something happened that caused them to start dividing and moving out from each other to the point that we have to this day. And we know that we're still moving. We're on plate tectonics that, that are in essence like floating only. And that's not a scientific way to put it. But I think you get my idea. So I find it interesting, but I think that probably happened to our world um, in, at this time, at the time of Peleg. Makes sense. Big enough that it got noted that way. Let's go back to Genesis 10. And we will pick up in verse 26. And in verse 26, we have Joktan became the father of Amadad and Sheleph and Hazarmavith and Yara and Hadoram and Uzal and Dikla and Obal and Abimael and Sheba. Boy, they were busy having kids. <laughs> okay. And really, there's 13 sons of Joktan that are named. Joktan's Peleg's brother, remember? And even though they're unknown in history specifically, all indications are that all of these 13 sons settled in Arabia. They're associated with the Arabian people. And it is wondered, there's one named Jobab, J-O-B-A-B. They're wondering if that's the one that we call Job. Don't know. One day we can ask the Lord. But uh, anyway, in the, in the area of Arabia. That's all I can say about all those names. Let me go down and also read Ophir and Havilah. There's Jobad. I forgot that it was here that was listed. Verse 29. All these were the sons of Joktan. So if so, then Job's father was Joktan. And we know that Joktan, we're going to see Abram come in very closely here. So again, it would put, it would put Job being born before Abram, but living about the time of Abram. So it, it fits, it could be, and it may not be. Okay, verse 28. And Obel and Abimael and Sheba. Okay, Sheba possibly is associated with those called the Sabians, S-A-B-E-A-N-S, the Sabians. They're definitely the ones located in southwest Arabia. The queen of Sheba, do you remember? Who'd she come visit? Queen of Sheba, who did she go visit? Very famous. Solomon. Solomon, Dora got it. King Shlomo, King Solomon. Read about it in 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 1 through 13. But this, this probably is where she came from. Uh, verse 29, and Ophir and Havilah and Jobab. Okay, Ophir is one I haven't talked about yet. At the south end of the Red Sea, Okay, now if you know ge geography at all in the area, Israel, go all the way down south. You come to Elat on the Red Sea. That's on one of the two fingers that goes up out of the Red Sea. Those two fingers come down. You see the whole body of the Red Sea. Below the Red Sea is Ophir. Okay, now much of the gold, and is Tony still on here? Sorry, Tony. I'm not talking Philippines, <laughs> rolling his ahead of me and laughing, and I'm so sorry to point it out to you, but Ophir was the area south of the Red Sea that the gold that was used to build the temple was famous for. Let me read to you, because Tony's going to say, wait a minute, <laughs> let me read to you, and then you argue with, with kings, Tony, because I don't have the answer, I'm not good at geography and putting it all together, I studied to teach you what I'm teaching you today, but I try to stay close to the Word of God. <laughs> Oops. Um, I'm taking you to 1 Kings chapter 9. If I can get my fingers to work right so that my tablet can read it. 1 Kings chapter 9. And that's not Tony squawking. <laughs> I really thought it was going to be. <laughs> 
said I wouldn't blame you, Tony, because you've done a lot of research and you may help me understand later, but for right now, this is it. 1 Kings 9 and verse 26. And we read there in verse 26, King Shlomo, King Solomon, also built a fleet of ships in Etzion Gever, which is near Elot on the shore of the Red Sea. Now, sorry folks, but we do know where Etzion Gever is. It's still named that on the Israeli map today. Elot is only spelled differently because you've got ancient language here with, with current language, but E-L-O-T-H is E-I-L-A-T today, Elot. Etzion Geber on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. Okay, and we know Edom is the south land south of Israel. Hiram, who those of you have been in our Bible studies during the week, you've been hearing about this Hiram. He sent his servants with the fleet, sailors who knew the sea, along with the servants of Solomon. So you've got Hiram from Tyre, from north Lebanon, who's helping build the temple. He's bringing in the cedars of Lebanon. He also went with Solomon's servants down south, down to Elot, down to the Red Sea area, where they went to Ophir and took 420 talents of gold from there and brought it to King Shlomo to put into the temple, to build a temple with that gold. So verses 26 and 28 make it pretty clear that Ophir is in the area of Etzion Geber, which is on Elot, which is on the, the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. I don't think you can get a whole lot more specific than that. I think that really sums it up and says a lot. So when we go back to Genesis 10, let me just take you up to verse 11 because we're a long ways from there. But in verse 11, why did I want 11? Okay, that's not the verse I wanted. Uh, oh, it's in 1 Kings. Okay, sorry. 1 Kings chapter 10. We were in 9. Go to chapter 10 and verse 11. I thought it was back in Genesis, but it's in 1 Kings. I'm not supposed to read that verse to you. My tablet does not want to go there. 1 <laughs> Kings chapter 10 and verse 11. There's where you've got your Queen of Sheba coming and visiting in verse 1. Now when the Queen of Sheba heard all the famous Shlomo, what we just talked about, go down to verse 11, and we read there also the ships of Hiram, what we just read about in chapter 10, which brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir a great very number of almug trees and precious stones. All this was used in the building of the temple, so... The gold that was used in the temple, Tony, I think I gotta say it didn't come from the Philippines. Even though there's another offer that you have uh, researched highly and you can explain to me what you want later, okay? <laughs> but uh, we see it in relation to the Red Sea area, Elot, Etzion, Gever in the scriptures. Going back to chapter 10 of Genesis, not of First Kings. Go back to Genesis with me. And we are ready for verse 31. Okay, I thought we had a question. I do. Go ahead, uh, and we're not ready for 31. We're ready for 30, but go ahead. Okay, this, this gold, did they take it from somebody, or did they dig it out? They dug it out, gold mines that are there. And even to this day, the area is known for the gold mines that are in that area. Um, I don't know that they're active in pulling gold out today. I somehow want to say they are. But don't quote me. <laughs> um. Hmm? Like you don't hear it like you do African Not like right, that. yeah, but there is uh, Solomon's area, Timna, which is southern, um, very close down to the Red Sea, the area of the Red uh, Mountains. I remember when we were down there, and I'm trying to, because that goes all the way back to the 90s when I was there. Uh, so I'm, I, I've really got to pull back, but Solomon was known for his gold mines down there. Um, but Israel's known more for diamond industry. I still somehow I think they get maybe some gold, but not as much as like the African um, mines are known for today. Uh, but the, obviously there was gold then. Huh. Gold in them, our hills back then. <laughs> and brought in to make the temple beautiful. So, okay. Um, back to, have I given us everything I think I have, we were in 29, we've done that. 30 is now their settlement extended from Misha as you go towards Safar, the hill country of the east. So we're just, we're south and we're looking east uh, is all that I can tell you about that. And then verse 31 says, these are the sons of Shem, 
according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. Again, another verse like what we read about Ham, that, that we've got families, languages, lands, and nations. Yet none of that it was true in chapter 10. Chapter 10 is looking forward because it knows it's already happened when it's being written. So it's like the, the writer putting in a note to help us understand 10 better. In other words, 10 is giving us all these names, and if the writer didn't insert this information, we wouldn't know where these areas, where these people went. All we know is we've got a bunch of people. Chapter 11 tells us they got scattered. Chapter 10 goes back and says this is where they got scattered to. 11 tells us why they got scattered. Okay, so they, we work with them together. There are 26 nations that are listed coming from Shem. Now, put on your thinking caps or your, your mathematical abilities to add because I asked you to also research how many nations and what's the significance of the number. Well, here I'm telling you, 26 nations from Shem, 30 nations from Ham, and 14 nations from Japheth were just named. How many does that total? Who did their homework? How many nations do we have? Nobody did their homework? Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay. There How many nations from here? Oh, okay, I got 26, 30, and the other one was what? 14. 14, okay. Dora's adding real fast, and I'm going to let her do it. 14 from here? Rowena's close. Okay. Use your phone. <laughs> 26 plus... 30 is 56, there we go, 70. I hear it by Dora, I hear it by Rhonda, and I see it by Rowena's fingers. <laughs> 70 nations that have been listed in chapter 10, okay? 70 nations. Now, why am I stressing that? What is the significance of the number 70? And I'm going to probably conclude class with this today, but I've got a number of points for it, and it's very interesting. And especially when I get to the last point, to me it's like, wow, I like that. So see if you do. Let me show you first, when we look at the significance of number 70 in Scripture, uh, 70 children of Israel came into Egypt from Canaan. This is Jacob's day. Okay, 70 went down into Egypt. I see Dora shaking her head. Yes, she's like, I remember that. <laughs> Genesis 46 and verse 27. I want to prove to you. It's not Rochelle, it's the word of God. And the sons of Yosef who were born to him in Egypt were two. All the persons of the house of Yaakov who came to Egypt were 70. So by the time they, they're united in Egypt, knowing Joseph, their brother, is, is the one sitting on the throne, we're told that 70 people came down into Egypt, okay? 70 is the number that, that is expounded on there. Let me take you to Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 32, key verse, Deuteronomy <clears throat> chapter 32. And we are going to look at verses 7 and 8. Deuteronomy 32, verses 7 and 8. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of all generations. Ask your father, and he will inform you. Your elders, and they will tell you. Okay, Moses, Moshe is writing Deuteronomy, and he's telling the, the people, the children of Israel, ask your dad, ask your grandfather, ask the elders about all these generations. When the Most High, that's God, gave the nations their inheritance, when he separated the sons of man, he set the boundaries of the peoples, a core number of the sons of Israel. How many children of Israel? Seventy. How many nations then? Seventy. Isn't that interesting? God is so exacting. <laughs> How can I say that? He was exactly on target of what he said. Apparently, the nations were divided into 70 because God's foreknowledge that the sons of Israel would be 70 people at this time that he was going to prophetically speak about them being. Ever since this point, with the nations here and tying it in, the number 70 
has been peculiarly, <laughs> it's a hard word for me, associated with the nation of Israel. Let me show you how. Okay, one of the biggest that you're going to say aha on right away is the 70 weeks of Daniel. That's a prophecy. It's a huge prophecy. It covers a multitude of years and time. But Daniel 9.24, and let's go look at it because this is critically important because there are people who don't pay attention to this. They read something else into it, and I'll tell you what in a moment, and they can get themselves into a whole lot of confusion. Babel. <laughs> I had to put it that way. Daniel 9 and verse 24. The start, the great prophecy I'm talking about, the 70 weeks of Daniel, is verses 24 through 27. But 24 says, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people and your holy city. Now, there's a number of reasons why it's for them. I'm not going to go into that because we're not on Daniel's 70th week. I'm not explaining all of that. But I've got to get my point here. It's very critically important. Daniel, Daniel, is the author of the book of Daniel. Okay? Makes sense. He wrote the book. They put his name on it. Okay? He's telling you what God said to Daniel. So when it says 70 weeks have been decreed for your people, I could put for your people, comma, Daniel. 70 weeks for the people of Daniel. Why am I stressing that? Because this whole prophecy, oh, and it's for Daniel's, his people, and the whole, your holy city. Anybody, what's the holy city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Unequivocally, never else, no, there's no other <clears throat> given that name on earth than Jerusalem. Washington, D.C. is our capital. It's not the holy city. The Vatican is not the holy city, okay? The only city named the holy city in scripture where God put his name is Jerusalem. So, Daniel, your people in relation to your people and your holy city. Who's Daniel's people? Jewish people. Jewish people. Thank you. What I want to warn you against is don't put the church in Daniel 9.24. Because if you do, you're going to rock your boat major. You're going to have trouble with the whole prophecy, and you're going to have trouble with the whole book of Revelation. You're going to have trouble with Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and even the minor prophets. And they're only minor because their books are shorter. That's the difference between a major and a minor is how many chapters in the book. All yet, they're not minor and less, like we got a major and we got a minor. No, it just simply means the length of books. The short books are called the minor prophets. The longer ones are called the major prophets. All of these are referring to Israel. There's a real Israel. God named them Israel, and he made promises to Israel. And he told Israel, there are coming troublesome times for Israel, the time of Jacob's trouble. Who is Jacob? Jacob gets renamed Israel. Jacob is when he's in his flesh. Israel, in your flesh, not obedient to your God. There are troublesome times coming. That's Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Daniel 9, 24 spells out about that time. None of these have anything to do with the church, okay? I love the fact that we have a church today, a called out assembly. It doesn't mean that we have a building and one denomination. What it's talking about is the people of God, the people who are called out, who he's called to salvation. They're called today the body of Messiah, the body of Christ. They're called the ecclesia. They're called the called out assembly. They're called the church. That's critically important, but don't mix up these differences. God has his nation Israel, God has his body called the church. The church is made up of Gentiles, yes. Jewish people, yes. Which ones? All Gentiles and all Jews? No. The ones who come to faith in Yeshua Jesus. They're the church, okay? Whether they're Gentile Christians or Jewish Christians, they make up that body. When we're back in Daniel, there's no such thing as a church yet. God's not referring to the church. He's referring to Daniel's people. There's Jewish people. Yes, that's who he's referring to. They have a holy city. That's Jerusalem. So what God is telling Daniel here is for the nation of Israel, for the Jewish people, 
looking to that final time when the promised Messiah is going to come in all his glory. That's what we see by the time we get to the end of verse 27. We have all that has happened. We have Messiah's first coming in verse 26 where he's cut off. And the Hebrew means violently cut off, picture crucifixion. But when we get all the way to the end, we have the Messiah coming in his glory. But it spells out, it doesn't even talk about that so much as it tells all these things, the abomination that will make the temple desolate, all of that are coming. So if you keep it separate, you're going to realize when you're talking about the tribulation, you're talking about Israel's future, not just Israel alone, the nations of the world, because Revelation 3.10 tells us it's going to come on the whole world. That's why the Holocaust was not the tribulation. It was a tribulation. It was a horrible tribulation, but it wasn't the tribulation that's going to come on the face of the whole world that is to be judgment on the earth dwellers because they're in judgment against God. They're, they finally, they've sinned enough. God sends his judgment, pours out his judgment on the earth dwellers on the earth. Well, that includes the nation of Israel in her rebellion against her God. But it does not include the Jewish believers or the Gentile believers. They're not in that. They're not on the earth called earth dwellers. They're called our citizenship is heaven. We're ambassadors from heaven on duty for the Lord today. We're not earth dwellers. Our citizenship is in heaven. We are heaven dwellers. We haven't gotten to be there yet, but that's what God calls us. And when he talks about his wrath being poured out on the entire world, on the earth dwellers to judge them with his wrath against sin, where does the church fit in there? It doesn't. Hallelujah. We're saved. We're forgiven. We are saved from the wrath to come. And that's not meaning just the last three and a half years. The whole thing is the wrath, the greater wrath, the full pouring out of the wrath. When God peels the lid off and lets it go and doesn't have it, it just leaking out. When he pours it out in its entirety, it's at the midpoint. When all, I can't say all hell breaks loose, but that's the expression that comes to mind, but it's God's doing, so I can't put it that way. It's the opposite, it's all God's doing. But that's what, what is being talked about in the tribulation. That's what's being talked about here in Daniel 9 on, yes, it falls on the Israel that's in rebellion to her God. I'm Israel. I'm an Israelite. I thank God, hallelujah, he looks at me through the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus. I'm saved. I'm saved from my sin. I'm saved from the wrath to come. Hallelujah. Don't mix them up, folks, and you won't have any problem with Scripture. God's got a huge plan that takes into consideration the entire world, keeps his word faithful to his nation called Israel, fulfills the promises to Israel, and the church has no problem with that. We are joint heirs with Messiah. Our glory, our heavenly home is heaven. It's not earth. It's heaven. And that's where we will be forever. We will come out of heaven with the Lord to set up that earthly kingdom in Israel, fulfilling the promises. Hallelujah. I didn't mean to get off on all that. <laughs> I just hear so much out there that, that makes me just cry out, keep it straight. Keep it straight. <laughs> Thank you, Dora. I love it. <laughs> Am I on my soapbox? Yes. <laughs> Forgive me for it. But it's so important to me because it, it, so many are shaky and scared and worried. And I'm here to tell you, perfect love casts out fear. If you are in the perfect love of God, you have nothing to fear. You are safe. You are saved, and you are saved from the wrath to come. I could give you a whole lot more. First Thessalonians 1 makes it so specific that, that he's talking to saved people, and he's telling saved people, you're saved from the wrath to come. That means he's not telling them you're saved from the wrath because you're not saved. He already declared, no, you've got your salvation. So what other wrath is there? Only the wrath of the tribulation, the wrath of God pouring out his wrath. So if you're already saved 
for salvation and you're being saved from the wrath to come, you're being saved from the tribulation. I could go on and on and on and on, but I'll quit, okay? <laughs> oh my word, 341. You know what? Let me just list them to you real quickly and tell you that one last thought because I want to have it complete, but I don't want to rush through. Maybe, maybe I can. Give me four minutes. Let's see how I can do it, okay? Because I don't think I'll go off. I think I've done it. The 70 weeks that we read about in Daniel 9, 70 in relation to the children of Israel, it's called 70 periods of seven years, okay? So you've got 70 weeks. You've got the 70 periods. Israel was led by 70 elders. We get that, and I'll let you look it up on your own. It's in Numbers, but Midbar, Numbers chapter 11, verses 16 and 17, and verse 25. These 70, Moshe was told to take these 70 elders up with them. They went up into the mountain. They went into Shekinah, the glory of God. They had a meal with God. Oh, we all want to know what that was like. And oh, we, beam me up, Lord. Give me a meal with you in your Shekinah glory. And if you're with us last Saturday, what, yeah, I think we got a book? taste. Michelle, what book? Numbers. What book? Numbers. Numbers okay, 11, thank you. Yes. Numbers 11, verses 16 and 17, and verse 25. Israel led by 70 elders. Later, there are 70 members of the Jewish Sanhedrin. That's their government. That's their council. Probably because of these 70 elders. It's probably what the foundation of the 70 for the Sanhedrin was later. It's interesting that 70 scholars translated the original scripture, you call it the Old Testament, into the Greek. The Septuagint version, when you hear that, the Hebrew put into the Greek because Greek was the common language, done by mm -hmm. 70 scholars. They took the Jewish scriptures. Notice how 70 is tied in with Israel. Man's allotted lifespan, according to Moshe, according to Moses, 70 years. That's Psalm 90. David isn't the only author of all the Psalms. He's the author of the majority, that's why he gets credit. But this one is believed to have been Moses's. It even starts out saying a prayer of Moses, the man of God. And chapter 90, and I got a fly here, verse 10 says, and I'll read it for you quickly, as for the days of our life, they contain 70 years. Or if due to strength, 80 years. So you're allotted 70. If you live 70, you've lived a full life. If you're really strong, you might get to 80. That's what Moshe was saying. But 70 years were given to man's allotted lifespan. And Moshe is the one saying it. Moshe is speaking to his children of Israel. Remember, time is a whole lot shorter. We're not living the hundreds of years that you see before. How long was the Babylonian captivity? 70. 70. Nope. 70 years. 70 years. Babylonian captivity. For 490 years, they had skipped the, Shabbat, the sabbatical year. God said, you skipped it 70 times. I'll give it to you all at once. I'm going to let the land have it 70 times that it should have lied fallow. Babylonian captivity, 70 years. Book of Daniel. Yeah, you're with me now. Okay. Yeah, Bab, um, when Daniel knew it was coming up close to 70 years, he started praying, God, it's about time. It's about time. Okay, there's your 70 years. Herod's temple. You've got Solomon's. We're past Solomon's. You're down to Herod. Herod's the time of Yeshua. So the temple that Yeshua was in. It was destroyed by the Romans, interestingly enough, about 70 years after Herod tried to murder baby Yeshua. And that just happened to be 70 A.D. So in 70 A.D., after about 70 years from when Herod had tried, and this is approximate, it's not exact, had tried to murder the baby, Yeshua Jesus, 70, and we see it in relation to Israel. Israel scattered out of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And here's my last point, and I did it in four minutes because I'm still on 345. Go with me to Luke 10.1, and we'll close up right here. <laughs> And uh, it, but this I find very, very interesting. Luke 10, 1 is talking about, well, it says it, so I'll just read it. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. 
So we know about the 12 Talmudim that worked with Yeshua Jesus. We talk about them all the time. But, and I think it was Maria even mentioned it in a Bible study the other day, but there were 70 that, God sent, that the Lord sent out. He sent them out in pairs. He sent them out into the cities. Why did he choose 70? And why is it phrased that way? Point is, 70 others sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. Could it be, not saying it's dogmatic, but could it be that Yeshua was using that as representative of the 70 nations that the word of God was going to go to the entire world, that the Lord's salvation would, was for all the nations of the world? Interesting thought. I like it. I like to think that's what the Lord was doing. Oh, my goodness, we have a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth has just popped in. If you didn't get that complete thought, if you have a question, let me know. I'll bring it back and start us on that note, but I find very interesting. God chose Israel to take the gospel message to the nations. When Israel didn't fulfill, God has now raised up the church to continue that and take the gospel to the nations, but we see it fulfilled through the 144,000 Jewish, somebody said Jewish Billy Grahams, okay, who take the gospel out to the ends of the earth. Was 70 representing that the gospel message the Lord intended for God to love the world, to the entire world? I like that. Number 70, in relation to Israel, in Scripture, I'm going to close this in a quick word of prayer, and then we're going to greet Ruth first. Ruth, we've already prayed for Michael and for you. Thank we'll you. let you update us, but I am just thrilled. I want to hug my screen. <laughs> That's the Zoom of the future. If we get a 1,000 years in the future, those Zooms, they'll be able to hug each other. <laughs> and as crazy as that sounds, just think how crazy Zoom sounded a thousand years ago to somebody else. If I would have said to somebody back then, you're going to look at faces of people in your living room on your TV screen, they would have said, what's a TV? <laughs> anyway, let's close in prayer because I'm out of time. Lord God, praise you for the accurateness, the detail, all that scripture teaches us, for showing us a God of love, for showing us the God of salvation, that you... Tell us that the gospel message is to go out to the Jew first, but also to the Gentile, that you never left anyone out for God so loved the world. Lord, we our hearts rejoice and we thank you and we thank you even for the magnanimous hand of God that kept a line of people and brought your beloved son, the Messiah, through that line and prove it in scripture that we know today, Yeshua Jesus is the Messiah, fulfillment of every promise you gave to Israel. Lord, our hearts rejoice, and we thank you. You are the God of our salvation. You are amazing and ineffable, and you are so in control of every detail of this world of our lives. Why should we worry? We thank you for your hand upon us and every need that is ours, answered in you, our beloved Amen. who gives us all that we need because all that we need is you. Thank you, praise you forever and ever. In Yeshua Jesus' name, amen. 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 What a note to end on. Ruth, shalom. Shalom, Ruth. Yes, yes, we miss you. She's muted. Roger's trying.